In Christian eschatology, the millennium is a thousand years where Christ rules on earth. But is this a literal thousand year period where Jesus physically rules the world from the throne of David in Jerusalem? Or is it an allegory? And if it is real, what is it going to be like for a thousand years with Jesus on earth physically ruling the world? We'll talk about it on this week's episode of Revelation Unveiled on Faith by Reason. Welcome to Faith by Reason. The website behind it all is faithbyreason.net. There you will find hundreds of hours of study material, blogs, podcasts, and video. And we are continuing our study of the book of Revelation, and we are just about ready to wrap things up, at least from a chronological point of view, because there are only three events, major events left in the book. That is the so-called millennium of Revelation chapter 20, then there is the great white throne judgment, and then there is eternity, the new heaven, the new Jerusalem, and that wraps everything up. But uh, before we get into uh, this week's uh, lesson, uh, this lesson, this week's uh, episode, uh, I want to highlight or call out and some accolades that Faith by Reason has recently received. Very exciting stuff. So um, Faith by Reason, the Faith by Reason podcast has been selected by the, yeah, sorry, I just want to make sure I get this right. It's been selected by um, a feed spot as one of the 30 best systematic theology podcasts on the internet. That is quite the, quite the accolade, quite the achievement. I appreciate it. Uh, you will see in the show notes, I'll have a link to the, uh, to the feed spot link where we are listed I think we're in the 20s somewhere um, of, of the best uh, systematic theology podcast. That's, you know, very exciting. I'm very flattered. I really appreciate it. And you will see on faithbyreason.net, I have put a link there as well, along with a logo for Feedspot. So thank you very much, Feedspot, for, and your panelists for selecting us, one of the 30 best systematic theology podcasts on the web. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I am actually doing a pretty good job here. So thanks again for that. All right, let's get into what we want to talk about on this week's episode. And uh, that is the so-called millennium. Uh, millennium it means thousand years. So mill in, in uh, Greek is a thousand. Millennium means one a thousand years. And interestingly, the millennium is, the concept of the millennium is one of the most controversial topics in eschatology. It's probably second only to the rapture. And it's really interesting that is so controversial because it's, it's controversial among Christians. I mean, secularists, atheists, they don't really care about the millennium. It's not a big deal to them, but it's very controversial in Christian circles. Again, surprising because the millennium talks about a reign of Christ on earth. Why on earth? Why on earth? No pun intended. Why would that be controversial among Christians? Well, there's some reasons for it that we're going to start our episode off with. But before we do that, let's, let's just read the section, the portion of Revelation where it, it details this thousand years. And then we'll, we'll go over a few more verses, um, other places where the millennium is mentioned, and we will go from there. So we're going to read from a Revelation chapter 20, uh, starting at verse 1, all the way to uh, verse 6. All right, here we go. Starting at verse 1, uh, chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a short while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness of, their witness of Je to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their forehead or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him for a thousand years." Okay, and that is, oh, no, I'm sorry. Hey, I got a little bit more. I'm sorry. So we're actually going to go through um, to, uh, verse 10, excuse me. So let's keep going. Now, when the thousand years have expired, 
Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are on the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay, and that's the actual end of the millennium. Sorry, I cut, I cut myself a little short. All right, and you will notice that I emphasized the, the phrase a thousand years, and there's a reason for that. We're going to get into it in a minute. But um, before we break down these verses, I want to... Th this period of the millennium is not just mentioned here in Revelation. This period of the kingdom of Christ on earth is actually a huge part of the of the of the biblical narrative and so i'm going to go to a few other verses that give more detail add more color to what this period of time is going to be like so let's go to some of those verses so we'll start with isaiah book of isaiah chapter 2 verses 2 through 4 again these are some mostly old testament passages that prophesy about this same period of time now will come about that in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains, and it will be raised above the hills. By the way, mountains are an idiom for governments. And all nations will stream to it, and many people will come by and say, Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many peoples. And they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. That means peace. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and will never again, never again will they learn war. And uh, by the way, you'll find a virtually identical passage in Micah chapter four, verses one through three. So you can look at it on your own. I'm not going to read from that because again, it's, it's virtually identical. Let's also go to Isaiah chapter 11, verses six through nine. And it says, and the wolf will dwell with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the young goat and the calf of the young lion and the fatling together. And the little boy will lead them and a cow will bear and the bear with, will, will graze. The cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play on the whole, whole of the cobra and the wean child will put his hand in the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Isaiah 65, verse 25. Again, the wolf and the lamb will graze together and the lion will eat straw like an ox and dust will be the serpent's food. They will do no evil or harm in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. Uh, Zechariah, uh, chapter 14, 16 through 20. Then will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and celebrate the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. And it will be that whichever of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to, to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And if the families of Egypt do not go up and enter, no rain will fall on them. It will be the plague to which the Lord smites the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. Then we went to the New Testament, a couple of um, uh, passages there, Matthew nineteen twenty eight, And Jesus said unto them, Truly I say unto you, that you who have followed me in this region, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you will also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Luke twenty two, twenty nine through thirty. And just as my father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So the there are there are other passages who I could actually spend this entire podcast with um, passages about this period of time, but it is throughout the Old Testament, it is one of the great promises to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that the world in the future will be ruled from Israel, from the throne of David in Jerusalem. The entire world will be ruled. God promised that. He made that unbreakable, unconditional promise to Abraham back in the book of Genesis. And this is the culmination of that, this millennial period is when all those things come to place. And it's something that the Jewish people have been looking forward to, had been looking forward to for a long time. In fact, when Jesus was on earth and the, he was asked constantly, when they, once, once they recognized he was the Messiah, that he was the anointed one, they said, when are you going to come to the kingdom? When are you going to take the kingdom? When are you going to set this thing up? They, they were waiting for it. And Jesus would always answer them, my time is not yet. 
He didn't say it wasn't, wasn't going to happen. He just said, it's not my time. The time is not yet. You know, just be a little patient. And that's going to be important when we get into uh, what we're about to talk about, which is the controversy around the literalness of the millennial period. There are many people, many Christians, in fact, most Christians who do not take this thousand year reign of Christ literally. Why? Why would you not? Why would the majority of Christendom not want to embrace the idea of Jesus, our Messiah, our Lord and Savior, reigning over the earth? Honestly, it's agenda driven. It's theology driven. It's pride driven. I've said before, I'll say it again. I'll say it many, many more times, as many times as it takes for people to finally get it. You should never try to make the Bible conform to your theology. Your theology should conform to the Bible. I will say that again. If your theology does not fit the Bible, then don't try to change your Bible. Don't try to change the Bible to make it fit what you believe. Change your beliefs to fit the Bible. And everyone you will see, everyone who denies the literalness of the millennium are doing just that. They are so tied to their theology, to their beliefs, that they ignore or obfuscate what the Bible clearly and literally says in order to make the Bible conform or contort to fit their beliefs. And that is pride because you are basically saying that what you believe, your personal theology, your agenda is greater than God's word because you have to twist and contort God's word in order to fit into what you believe. And that is invalid and it's prideful and it's tragic. And the fact that people don't see that they're doing this is, is the biggest tragedy of all. But as I said, the major factions of Christianity, the majority of them, don't believe it. The preterists don't. They're not a big factor, but they're, you know, they're one of the big ones who don't believe it. We'll talk about that in a bit. The Catholic Church, which is the biggest, quote unquote, Christian organization in the world, they don't believe in the literal millennium. And the mainline Protestant church doesn't believe it. And let's talk about why. Let's start with the preterists. And by the way, I, this is something I went into in more detail early on in the this Revelation study. I think maybe the second or third episode. Uh, is, is mostly based on man's views of the of, of revelation, and we talk about the people who are amillennial, um, postmillennial, and premillennial. Amillennial, basically, when you put an, basically when you put an A in front of something, you're you're saying that you don't believe in it. For example, an, an A theist doesn't believe in any type of theology, any type of deity. They are against the idea of a supernatural deity, so they're a theist. A millennial means you, they don't believe in a literal millennium. Why not? Well, briefly, the preterists don't believe in it because, again, it doesn't fit their theology. Preterism is the idea that everything in the in Revelation up until about chapter the, the second half of chapter 20 has already occurred. Most of it occurring in the set in 70 AD uh, of the all the cataclysmic events of Revelation, the, the bowls of wrath, the trumpets, the four horsemen. All of those are apparently all that all those events are actually idioms of what happened in 70 AD when the Roman legions came in and destroyed Jerusalem. So if you're a preterist and you have to believe that everything in Revelation, again, up to the chapter, middle of chapter 20, has already occurred, and you have to allegorize a lot because these things didn't literally happen. There weren't literal bowls of wrath being poured out. So you have to say it was an allegory for the Roman devastation, that including the second coming of Christ. If you're a preterist, you believe that Jesus apparently returned in 70 AD, even though no one witnessed it, no one decided to jot it down. But apparently he came back in some form and rules in our heart. So you also have to believe, if you're a preterist, that the millennium has already has occurred as well. And the thousand years is not a literal thousand years because, you know, Jesus wasn't literally on a throne for a thousand years starting in the 70 AD. So Jesus rules in our heart. And preterism is ridiculous. It's unbiblical. There, it, no aspect of it can be biblically proven. It still stuns me that people believe it, but there are a, a faction of people who still vehemently believe that nonsense. But it, there, there's no evidence for it. Um, there's no evidence that Jesus returned in 70 AD. It's, it's, it's nuts. But moving on, the next major group who believes in it because of their agenda is the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church believes that, that Jesus will not physically, literally return and rule over the earth. Why do they believe this? Well, look at their agenda. The Catholic Church, and again, I'm not speaking of the regular rank-and-file Catholic people. I'm speaking of the Catholic hierarchy, the Vatican. The Vatican is basically the inheritors of the Roman Empire. The Caesars and emperors of Rome just changed their names to popes 
in uh, around the uh, fourth and fifth century, starting with Constantine. Constantine was the last Roman emperor. He uh, allegedly converted to Christianity, and he anointed he made Christianity legal, which was a good thing because it stopped Christians from being tortured and tormented in the Roman Empire. But he, but Constantine also made himself the head of the church. He made himself Pontifex Maximus, which is the same title that the popes have to this day. He made himself the first pope, not Peter. That's ridiculous. Peter was never a pope. That's that's a myth. The first pope was Constantine, and his third successor, Theodosius, made uh, Christianity the official religion of Rome, and that just started a whole cavalcade of really just horrible things happening. But the popes are just no, nothing more than the Caesars. They were the rulers of the world. They ruled the world overtly for another thousand years, and covertly from you know around uh, the 1400s to this very day. And that's a whole other thing we've talked about before. I'll have to say, you know, the popes are the rulers of the world. The Vatican's are rulers of the world. So the idea that, to quote um, Chuck Missler, the late Chuck Missler, the idea that Jesus would come and set up a kingdom and kick out the evil rulers didn't really sit too well with the evil rulers. So the, the papacy being those evil rulers. So they don't want people, their their flock, their the Catholic people, waiting for Jesus to come back and set up a kingdom. They want so they want to keep their temporal power. So they say, oh, no, no, no. Jesus isn't physically coming back. He rules in our hearts. So we, the Catholic Church, we are the we are the keepers of the kingdom. And Jesus just rules through us. He rules in your heart. He rules through Catholicism. There's no literal thousand years. And also you have the mainline Protestant church that is a millennial, not because they overtly say that Jesus isn't going to rule, but because they don't teach it. If you don't teach something that you are tacitly admitting that it doesn't exist. So if you don't teach the millennium, if it's not a part of your doctrine, then you are saying that there's it's not really a thing. And most mainline Protestant churches do not mention the millennial reign of Christ as part of their theology, as part of their mission statements, as part of their, their church charters. They just ignore it. And some do outright deny it or deny the literalness of it, even Again, one of the people I admire greatly, the late Dr. Michael Heiser, he doesn't believe in a literal thousand years, which is amazing to me. I would listen to his Revelation study, and he reads the, these words here where the word a thousand years or the phrase a thousand years is mentioned six times. And even despite that, he just says, well, you know, it's the millennial reign is just part and parcel of the rest of the Armageddon scenario somehow. But I don't want to get into details on that. Again, I respect Dr. Heiser a great deal, but his expertise is in the Old Testament. He doesn't, and, and he only looks at the New Testament to the degree that it amplifies the Old Testament. So he's not really into eschatology. It's never been his thing, and I think that's one of the reasons why he has a, a bit of a blind spot and is really obtuse about the millennial reign. And again, I, I it, it just amazes me that you know Christians don't make this a, a bigger part. It's the most exciting period, I think, in our history where we will spend a thousand years with Jesus physically ruling the world, we'll finally have the government that people have been begging for. And that is what we're going to talk about in the next episode when we get into the why. We know we're going to talk about what happens in this episode, episode, what the millennium is. And in the next episode, we're going to talk about why it happens and what the whole purpose of this period of time is. Because it's a fixed time. It's only it's not forever. It's just a thousand years. So, But there are certain reasons that... Uh, this period of time is happening, certain things that God wants to do to finally wrap up his story. All right, so then there are a couple others. There's the post-millennials and, and pre, the pre-millennial and post-millennial. And, and the pre and post have to do with when they believe Jesus is going to return. The post-millennials believe that Jesus returns at the end of the thousand years. The pre-millennials believe that he returns before the thousand years. Post-millennials, very briefly, they believe that the that we're in the millennium right now, that we are in that period of time, and it is the job of Christians to basically conquer the world in the name of Jesus. That the Great Commission, where Jesus said at the end before he ascended to heaven, you know, go to the to the disciples, he said, go out into the world and make disciples of all men, and you know, teach them uh, the, the statutes of Jesus. And they, the post millennials, take this to mean that we're supposed to witness to the entire world, convert the entire world to Christianity, and then. Once we've done that and the world is completely Christian, then Jesus will return and our church, the church will present the world to Jesus as a gift, more or less. Uh, that, it, that, 
theology was very popular in the 1800s. And it's and the people who do it now or believe in it now, they're called like the, the Reconstructionists or the Dominion Now people. And the reason it was popular in the 1800s is because the world seemed to be getting better and more Christian. The 1800s were known as a time of great, of great missionary trips. People were going around the world, spreading the, the news of Jesus, and they were converting hundreds, thousands, thousands of people in the Philippines and in, the, and in Asia and in India and in Africa. And things were looking great. And so people were believing, hey, we're, we're winning. Christianity's winning. Then, of course, the 20th century happened. And we had the world wars. We had the um, the, the uh, communist revolutions, like really terrible things in the 60s in Vietnam. And it's pretty clear at this point that things are not getting better. The world is not becoming more Christian. The world is becoming less Christian. So there are actually very few people who still believe in the Dominion Now aspect or who are post-millennialists. They're a very small, very vocal group because... If, you, if, you're, if you're a logical person and you see that you, what you believe is wrong, you abandon it. But the illogical people, instead of abandoning a, a false belief, they just double down and believe it harder and become more vocal. So the post-millennialists are a very small but very vocal group who still, some, for some reason, believe that they're going to win by converting the world to Christianity. It's not going to happen. Sorry, folks. That's, I've, read the, I've read the book. It's, that's not how things end. And finally, there are the pre-millennialists, which, of course, I fall into that category. Those are people who believe that Jesus will reach, that they're, number one, that there is a literal thousand years and that the and and that Jesus returns before the thousand years. Why do people like me believe in premillennialists that Jesus returns before the thousand years? Well, because um, I understand basic mathematics. That Jesus returns in Revelation chapter nineteen, and the millennium is Revelation chapter twenty. And so I know enough about math to know that nineteen comes before twenty. Therefore, Jesus returns before the millennium. Ergo, premillennial. Also, I understand math and that a thousand years, if the thousand years began when Jesus ascended to heaven in, in, in what, about 33, 34 AD, uh, it's been more than a thousand years since then. If that were the case, the millennium should have ended around the 10th century. It didn't. We are a thousand years past <laughs> the 10th century. Therefore, the millennium could not have happened when Jesus re returned, meaning when, when Jesus uh, ascended, ascended to heaven, meaning that the thousand years hasn't happened yet. So it's a so premillennialists believe that the thousand years has have not happened yet, and they will happen after the Battle of Armageddon when Jesus returns. So that's that. Sorry, that took longer than I thought. So let's get into what the millennium is going to be like. And by the way, one more thing I want to mention is that the some of the amillennialists, especially in the Protestant Church, there, there, there's a, a subtle and sometimes not so subtle anti-Semitism to their denial of the millennium because the millennial reign is very Jewish. It was a promise made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The, this is something that the Jewish people have been waiting for for a long time. Again, as I said, during the time of Jesus, they were always asking him, when are you going to come into your kingdom? Now, if the, if the millennium wasn't real, if it, wasn't, if it was an allegory, Jesus could have told the disciples and said, hey, you know, Guys, this millennial, this kingdom you're waiting for, is not going to be a real kingdom. It's just going to be me ruling in your hearts. But he didn't say that. He said, it's not happening yet. Wait for it. So the fact, so that's another reason to believe that the millennium is future and it's real because Jesus could have denied it. He could have told the disciples, guys, guys you have it wrong. It's not a real thousand years. So basically, if you are a millennial, you're basically saying that Jesus either lied to or at the very least was deceptive to his disciples and his followers, and they kept asking him, when is he coming into his kingdom? Because he could have just told them that it was allegorical, and he didn't. He just said, wait for it. All right, let's get into what the millennium is like. Well, actually, let's just let's go and break down these verses, and we'll kind of intersperse some of the Old Testament prophecies that I spoke about earlier. Okay, so where we are in the chronology, Armageddon has just ended. Jesus you know, came down, he spoke the word, the words came out of his mouth, and all of his enemies, the Fallen angels, fallen Elohim, the, the Nephilim, and any humans who are still part of the army, they were just completely wiped out. The Antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet were cast into the lake of fire. The next thing that happens is, in chapter 20, it says, he saw an angel coming down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit. So some angel, an angel comes down with a great chain. He chains up the Satan, the devil, the dragon, the Nakash, the serpent of old, the Nakash of old, the original evil, and tosses him into a pit. This is interesting here because this, you know, throws water on that silly idea 
that Satan is somehow God's rival, that Satan and God are, are locked into this battle and they're equal or, or similar in power and they're just battling back and forth. No, Satan is nothing to God. God spoke him into existence. God can speak him out of existence. Satan is just nothing more than a tool for God to, to uh, make his plan come to pass. Satan is no threat to God, so much so that you have a random angel. We don't even know, this angel isn't even named. He just says, an angel is given a chain and just wraps Satan up in it, up with it and tosses him into the pit. No muss, no fuss. Satan is not a threat to God. A random angel just disposes of him quickly. Why is this happening? Why is he, he cast into the bottomless pit of the abyss, the abuso? He's he shut up and a seal is set on him. So why? So that he should deceive the nations no more for a thousand years. Again, it's a thousand years. It's said over and over and over again. The fact that people want to allegorize this is just nonsense. The Bible could not be more clear. It says six times in a matter of about 10 verses that it's a thousand years. It's not an allegory, people. It is a thousand bloody years. Get that through your heads. Okay. So he says, so it's that he should deceive the nations no longer. So this means that for a thousand years, 1,000 years, the nations won't be deceived by spiritual evil anymore. Satan is bound. What about the rest of the fallen angels? What the rest of the fallen Elohim? Well, remember, they, they were defeated at Armageddon. It's, they were prophesied in Psalm 82 that these fallen angels, these fallen Elohim, are going to, quote unquote, die like men. That was their judgment. What does it mean to die like men? Well, when human beings die, we go, human beings go to um, Hades, to the, it's the holding area, until the final judgment. You know, there was a, there was a good part, which was called Abraham's bosom, where the holy, where the righteous dead, like, you know, Abraham and King David and, you know, all, all the, and Noah and, and people like that in the, in the Old Testament were um, held in, in the good part. And then Hades was an area of torment where the bad, evil dead were kept until the final judgment, which we'll talk about in the next section. So all the fallen angels are in Hades and the devil is in the bottomless pit. So there is no more spiritual evil on earth. So the spiritual evil, which is the power behind the power, all of the people who rule the world to this day, kings and queens and other types of monarchs and emperors and dictators and prime ministers and presidents, all of them throughout history have been influenced by spiritual evil. We've talked about that many times. There is a spiritual component to man's leadership. And they've been influencing nations and driving nations to war and to subjugate other human beings and to do many of the evils that are in the world. They're going to be gone. There will be no spiritual influence. And because of that, the world's going to be a very, very different place. When, when um, the leadership is not being motivated, when we're not being tempted by spiritual evil, they're all going to be gone. They're all going to be locked away. And because of the lack of that spiritual evil, the world is going to be a very different place. As we saw in some of the passages I was reading before, that's going to be peace. War is driven by spiritual evil. Human beings don't want to go to war. There's no one who gets up in the morning saying, you know what I really want to do today? I want to get a gun and march into another country and start shooting people. Nobody wants that. That's always driven by leadership. Only kings and only the kings, the monarchs, the emperors, the dictators, those are the ones who want more, war. Common people, all we want to do is have a nice plot of land, build a home, take care of our family, have, you know, have something to eat and have something to drink and have a nice time. That's all we, that's all the common person wants to do. The only people who want war are the leaders who are always influenced by spiritual evil. But without spiritual evil, man will have, will have no desire for war. There will be no more war. It was said that you, they'll, they'll you know, beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. They won't need weapons of war anymore. So there'll be total peace. The animal kingdom is going to change. It says that the, the lion will eat straw like an ox. So there's not, there won't be any carnivores. Animals won't kill each other anymore. And there won't be, it won't be dangerous anymore. It says that, you know, little children will play on the, over the holes of cobras and serpents. And cobras and serpents are, you know, are, not only are they physically, you know, dangerous animals, they're also idioms for animals that are out of control. It says that, you know, the cattle, you know, the lion and the wolf, I mean, sorry, the lion and the lamb will lie down together. You know, the, the wolf and the, and the bear and the cattle will all be together. It's going to be a peace. It's going to be Edenic. It's going to be very much like Eden. It's going to be total peace in the human realm and in the animal realm. It's going to be an amazing time. There's going to be total provision for everyone. There won't be any starvation under the rule of Jesus. Everyone will have 
all they want to eat. I mean, you could have that today. I mean, there's plenty of food, as we all know, to feed everyone on Earth. The only thing stopping the food from getting to everyone is the people who control distribution, which are, again, the evil people who are influenced by spiritual evil. So there will be total peace in the world. There will be total provision in the world. There'll be the perfect government in the world. Jesus will rule on earth with us. It says in, in, in uh, verse four of Revelation chapter 20, there were thrones and those who sat on them were, were uh, judgment was commissioned to them. Who's on those thrones? Um, Christians, if you're a Christian, you will be on that, those thrones. We we've talked about those thrones before. We saw them in uh, Revelation chapter four, um, where we saw the you know, thrones and, and the 24 elders representing the church were on the thrones. So not only will um, Christians and believers be ruling the world, which means you and I will, in our resurrected bodies will have that, uh, that, that uh, rulership will be Jesus's proxies to enforce his, his justice and to rule with him. So will the people who were killed during the tribulation. It says that those who did not receive the mark of the beast, who were able to endure and came to Christ during that time, they will be resurrected and they will also be um, leaders and they will rule and reign with Christ. So believers, we will be the, you know, we'll, we'll be part of the government. We'll be, you know, for lack of a better term, we'll be the, the, the Congress and the Senate and the police force and the judges. We will be helping Jesus rule. And also all the Jewish believers from old, will be resurrected. This is part of what's called the first resurrection. The first resurrection is a category. It is the first time that er that all the dead are brought back and given bodies. So it's not the same as the rapture. In the rapture, um, we are caught up to heaven. Our spirits are caught up to heaven, but then we're given our our bodies in, in, the, in the first resurrection, which is this category when all believers are resurrected and for a thousand years we will rule and reign with Christ. So it'll be an amazing, amazing time. There will be, oh, another thing is the the lifespan. I don't think I read this. So let, me, let me bring up that the verse. Um, it's, um, it's Isaiah 65, verse 20. It says, no more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. What does that mean? It says the child shall die at 100 years old, meaning that some, during this period of time, during this millennial period, if you are 100 years old and you happen to die, then you, you're considered a child. When, if you're 100 years old and you, and, and you die, oh my God, that poor child, because 100 years old, it means we're going to live for considerably more than that, for hundreds of years, probably for the entire length of the millennium will people live. How If, if you are a believer, it also says here that if you are a, a sinner, if you're not believing, that you only, you're only going to live 100 years, you're going to die. If you are a believer in Christ, 100 years, you're going to age slowly, like we did in, during the antediluvian period, that, just the period before the flow, where people lived, you know, six, seven, eight hundred years. So if you're a believer, you'll have extended life. But if you're not a believer, you're basically going to have the same life as we have now, where, you know, if you, you're lucky to get to 100 years. So I think that's really interesting. That brings up another point. What's the, where's the population going to come from? Because all the believers, we're going to be in resurrected bodies. We're not going to be, we're not going to age at all. So who are these people who are going to age and die? These are going to be people, I think that population comes from a couple of sources. One is going to be the Jewish remnant. Remember when, when we had the Armageddon uh, episode, Jesus came and rescued the, the Jewish remnant that was hiding. I believe they're going to be, they're going to be hiding in uh, Edom, which is modern, modern day Jordan. Uh, I'm sorry, Basra, sorry, modern day Jordan, I believe probably at, at Petra. And so they'll be just regular human beings. And, and if there are any other people who, who managed to survive the Armageddon and haven't taken the mark of the beast, be, and they may be you know, Christians who survive somehow, or maybe unbelievers who, for whatever reason, didn't take the mark of the beast, there will be the human beings who will populate the world. And they're going to populate and they're going to reproduce. And if they become believers, which I can't imagine why they wouldn't be uh, with Jesus physically ruling, then they're going to live extended periods of time and they can have a lot of children and they're going to give birth to many people. And we'll see that at the end that there's going to be a huge population. But there will be people who interestingly but won't believe. As I said before, I can't I can't imagine why you wouldn't be a believer, but there will be some people who won't believe. We'll talk about why in the next episode, but there will be unbelievers. It, there, and, and there will be nations who might be unbelievers. So nations will still exist. And we saw earlier, we, we just read that nations will have to come up to Jerusalem 
for the, the Feast of Tabernacles. That is the, the seventh feast, the seventh of the Jewish feast, the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. They're to come up every year. The whole world is to come to Jerusalem every year to participate in that Feast of Tabernacles, which is a, a dress, which had been a dress rehearsal for the millennium from the time of the law being given in Leviticus. Uh, the, so this, this Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, was, again, a dress rehearsal for the millennium where, you know, Jesus reigns, rules and reigns. And it will be commemorated. It'll be the, the main holiday. It won't be any more Christmas or Easter or anything like that. The main holiday of the world will be the Feast of Booths or the, or the Feast of Tabernacles. And nations will be required to come up and celebrate it. But apparently some nations won't. And it says here that if, you, if you're a nation that doesn't do that, you won't get rain in your land. It, it mentions Egypt specifically, and I think they might be thinking more about the spiritual Egypt, not necessarily that that people who are in the physical land of Egypt and Northern Africa won't do it. Maybe they won't. But whatever these nations are at this time with the population that survived the tribulation, if they decide, well, we're not going, they aren't going to get rain. What does that mean? That means there's, that there's going to be sin in the millennium. That's remarkable. That even though you're going to have perfect provision, there's going to be perfect peace, there's going to be peace in the natural world, and you know animals are going to behave, and it's going to be perfect justice. People will still rebel because that's just what's in our hearts, and we're going to get into that more in the next episode when we talk in detail about the reason behind it. But yeah, there are going to be people who do not want to obey Jesus, even though he you you can see him, you can go to Jerusalem and physically see him. All right, what else do we have? Yeah, so eventually the millennium will end after the thousand years. It's a set period of time. After the thousand years have expired, it says Satan's going to be released from the abyss. And he will go out to deceive the nations, the four corners of the earth. And it says they're like their numbers of sand of the sea. So apparently people are going to be really reproducing a lot during this thousand years because there's going to be, I think the sand of the sea is an allegory because, I mean, there are trillions of, of grains of sand. And that's just the earth couldn't, couldn't hold that capacity of human beings. Maybe it could. I, I don't see how, but... I'm going to take that as an, an idiom that it's just going to be a huge population. If it turns out to be that many people, then you know, so be it. But apparently it's going to be a huge population. And once Satan is released, he's going to do what he always does. He's going to deceive these nations and he's going to have them make war. Remember what I said before, people do not want to make war on their own. They only want to make war when they're influenced by spiritual evil. And when Satan is released, he's going to go out. He's going to quickly deceive the nations. He's going to organize them, galvanize them, teach them how to make war, which is what happened originally during the time of the uh, the antediluvian period. If you read the pseudepigraphal book of Enoch, there was a, a an angel in Elohim called Azazel who taught men how to make war. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done it. There was no war before um, Azazel did that, which is, again, it's a document, which is documented in the book of Enoch. He's going to, Satan is going to have people ready to make war, and they're going to want to do what? Conquer Jesus. They're going to do what they want to try to do at Armageddon and what they what Satan has wanted to do from the beginning. They're going to go up all from all over the earth. They're going to surround the beloved city, which is Jerusalem, and they're going to try to overthrow Jesus because they're not going to like his rule. Why on earth wouldn't you like this rule of Jesus where you have everything you want, where you have provision and peace and and long life? Yeah, because of our nature. We'll talk about that again in the next episode. But it doesn't last long. Oh, oh, by the way, I want to mention that it does say Gog and Magog. He deceives the nations from the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. And I mentioned uh, during the, probably the last episode when we talked about the um, the Gog-Magog war, is this the war? Maybe. Um, I have some issues with it. And one of those issues is that Gog is an entity. Magog is a land. Magog is a nation. No problem with that. But Gog is an entity and all the entities, uh, the spiritual entities, the evil ones, should are either are in Hades at this point. So how could this Gog release? I don't think so. I think that when it says here Gog and Magog, I, I think it is a reference to um, just the fact that these nations are are going to experience something similar to the Gog Magog war. I, I, I'm still tending towards the idea that the Gog Magog conflict happens either right before the uh, tribulation or at, during the early portions of the tribulation. I, I don't think that this cleanly fits into the Gog Magog scenario of Ezekiel chapter 38, 39. I could be wrong, but Gog, the entity that, that is Gog, should be 
in Hades at this point. He, he should have been taking care of it at Armageddon, so I don't think that fits. Anyway, this is a very short-lived rebellion. Satan gathers everyone around, gathers everyone together. They go to make war against Jerusalem. God doesn't mess around. He sends fire from heaven and devours them all. And that's done. It's a really quick, quick thing, just like Armageddon was a quick thing. Why did this happen? Yeah. Next episode, we'll, we'll get into the whys behind it. We're just talking about the what's in this episode. Then after that, it says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. This is really interesting because after we get done with the millennium, we're going to talk about the great white throne judgment, what that means, and we're going to talk about what hell the lake of fire actually is. Because there are some people who believe that hell means you're just annihilated. When you, when you go to the lake of fire, Poof, you're just burned up. There's you know, a lot of Christians, Christian theologists, who don't believe that hell is, is eternal, that it's just a quick thing and poof, you're done. This speaks again. This is one of the areas that speaks against that because it says, this is, he, Satan is cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, not where they were, but where they are. Remember, they were cast into the lake of fire at the beginning, right before the millennium started. And now, a thousand years later, they're still there. So they're still there after a thousand years. So that speaks against the whole annihilation uh, theory of what hell is. So, but we'll we'll get into that more later. But okay, that's um, pretty much it. That is the millennial reign of Christ. He Satan is bound. Jesus rules for a thousand years. The the earth is very. It's a com combination of what Eden was like and what the pre-flood world was like. It's it seems to be on the surface a, a an amazing time. But it will not be a, it would not be a sinless time. There will still be sin there. People will still sin, and when Satan is released, they will quick he will quickly galvanize the evil of the world, and they will attempt to overthrow Jesus. And of course, they will fail miserably. That is the what of the millennium. In the next episode, we're going to talk about why. What was the purpose of this? Why it, does this thousand year period need to happen? What is God trying to accomplish here, and how does it fit in? to the overall story of Jehovah, which is what the Bible is, and how does it fit into the dispensation model that we've been talking about on Faith by Reason for many, many years now. We're going to talk about that next time. All right, thank you for listening and watching. I appreciate it. Uh, please subscribe to Faith by Reason on YouTube or on Rumble, or best way to do it is to subscribe at faithbyreason.net. And put your email to the left, excuse me, to the right navigation area, and you will get these episodes as soon as they come out. And we will talk to you next time when we look at the purpose of the millennium. Then we get into the great right from judgment, and then we are in to we'll talk about hell. Then we will talk about eternity in the new Jerusalem. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.